The following episode of the Carnival of Randomness is sponsored by an important message to you, the people from Upsitnik and Associates. Every day there are forces that are taking from you, stealing from you. Your money, your time, your freedom. Immense faceless corporations, banks, credit card companies, insurance providers, government agencies, this list goes on and on. When you are under attack and facing crisis, turn to us, Upsitnik and Associates, attorneys for you, the people. When every day becomes a battle, we can advise and assist. We have been advocates for 40 years. Email us through UpsitniksLaw.com or call us at 1-866-391-3299 or reach out to us through Upsitnik and Associates on Facebook for a prompt, no obligation, communication, and consultation. Don't be pushed around. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Carnival of Randomness. I'm Rob and Zach somewhere over there, aren't you? I'm over here. I'm down the end. You may know, listening to this, that I'm very passionate about the local music scene. You obviously know all the musicians we have on here. It's amazing. There's a song called Slackjawed and Troutmouth that the High Rise is playing. Greg Townsend told me the story behind his Bill Kirchin heard the play and said, You guys make me feel Slackjawed and Troutmouth. And he would always say, Rochester... You have to appreciate the kind of music we have here because not a lot of places have bands. Every Literally, you could probably go out every night around here and see something. And one of the things for that, finally, we are honoring these musicians with our Hall of Fame here. And we have people behind the Rochester Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. The big ceremony is coming up in a couple of weeks, and we're going to talk about that, a little bit of history. So we have our guests this week, and we have over to my left, which you can't see because we're not on the anything we we're not see, on the tv is uh ken colombo and then we have bruce Pilato. hello hello and jerry Felzone. howdy good and morning now how did this all come about the idea of starting this the rochester hall of fame yeah. <laughs> you were there well actually i can't I, I wasn't at the very beginning there was a kind of an exploratory committee that uh, festered around for a couple of years trying to get it off the ground and then uh i think it was around 2011 or so uh, the nucleus of the of the board that we have now came together, and they, uh, you know, Carl Laporta was was the guy who put it all together, and he brought in a guy named Jack Whittier, who is now our president, and you know they were able to uh, get a pretty good group of people. I know Jerry came in, I think, after the first year, or maybe the second year. I think I, I I started volunteering on the second year and came in on the fourth year that I actually became a member of the board. Right. So they, you know, they, I got approached by Jimmy Richmond, who's a local musician who plays uh, primetime funk. And he, he said, Bruce, we, we need you to get involved in this thing called the Rochester Music Hall of Fame. Because I had, you know, I had a pretty good career as, a, you know, in the music business. I had uh, worked initially as a music journalist, writing for Variety and USA Today and Rolling Stone and all that stuff. And then I worked, I did a thing called the King Biscuit Flower Hour, which was a, a live broadcast uh, concert thing that ran nationally, and I worked uh, on a lot of record label uh, compilations for Rhino and people like that. I did 50 box sets. And so I knew quite a few people, and I had gotten into management. I was working at the time with Emerson, Lake, and Palmer and some of those groups, and I had worked with Ringo Starr and a whole bunch of people like that. So he said, could you, you, know, could you get involved? I said, well, you know, I'm pretty active in the Grammy organization, and I've been involved in the Grammy Awards since 1989. And I said, if you guys want to do this, I'll get involved under one condition. You've got to do it the right way. I mean, you know, I'm not interested in being involved in an organization that's just going to, you know, go to some little kind of dinky club and, you know, give out some kind of paper award or something. I mean, I mean if you want to raise some sponsors and do it the right way and have it at a place like the Eastman Theater... I'll get involved. And that was kind of my criteria for it. Um, fortunately, everybody was thinking the same way. And Jack was able to get some initial funding, which was really great, which got us off the ground. And uh, we had our first event in 2012 where we inducted Chuck Manjone and Gene Cornish of the Rascals and uh, um, Joe English, uh, Joe English, uh, uh, Jeff Tyzik, and um, uh, Dort Anthony, who was a... 91-year-old flautist who had been in the Boston Philharmonic. 
And one of the things I have to correct you on is you called it the Rochester Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. It's actually the Rochester Music Hall of Fame. Yeah, I found that out because I kept trying to Google Rochester yeah. Rock and Roll I do. Hall I of Fame. I made the same like, mistake. No, it's this one. I admit right. I made the same mistake with the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Yeah, I, I yeah. did that you as well. You called them the Rochester Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But well, what's, what's interesting about it is that, you know, we do get some criticism from people around town. That, well, you haven't done this band and you haven't done that band and you haven't done this rock guy and... It's like, wait a minute, guys, you know, we're doing classical musicians, jazz musicians. You know, we, we found a home at the Eastman. I mean, they've, they've, uh, they started working with us in the beginning with the, uh, renting us the theater at a great rate. And, you know, we've had this really great event, which is a, a black tie, you know, uh, very classy event. First uh, class, absolutely. Yeah, and, um, you know, through my connections and through the connections of some of the other people, you know, we brought in incredible guests. We had Paul Schaefer, uh, who played uh, to honor uh, Lou Soloff of Blood, Sweat, and Tears. Uh, I was able to get the original singer, David Clayton Thomas. Actually, the original singer was Al Cooper. But, uh, That's right. <laughs> but uh, I got David Clayton Thomas in, and, you know, they did a whole medley of BS and T songs. And, you know, we I was able to assemble, uh, I think, four of the original James Brown guys when we did uh, Pee Wee Ellis. We had uh, Maceo Parker and Fred Wesley. So anyways, uh, you know, the whole idea is to give people a a really great event that honors Rochester and the people that lived here and came out of here, not necessarily lived here all their life, but had some Rochester experience that was, in in most cases, at least a year. Uh, You know, a lot of them are Eastman people who were here for three or four years. Well, Tony Levin went there, didn't he? Yeah, Yeah, it's uh, Tony Tony Levin, Ron Carter. I mean, about 500 albums he's played on. It's it's amazing the amount of albums that guy has been on. Yeah, well, he did did the last recording session with John Lennon the night he was shot. He was going to go on tour with them, I guess. If they were going to tour, he was going to play with them. Right. So, you know, we've just tried to take it to that level and... uh, Last year, it kind of uh, eclipsed with uh, Gad and Levin, who we kind of inducted together because they had done so much together. And um, I called Paul Simon's office, n- never thinking he would come to Rochester, just saying, could we get a video from you that we'll show, you know, before they're inducted? And uh, and then I had to explain what it was and what we were doing. And his uh, assistant, Juanita, called me back and said, Paul wants to know if he can come up and play there. Oh, I think what people don't cool. I think what people don't realize is being musicians, they realize how important having quality behind them is. And maybe people who just listen to like a Brian Wilson, like Pet Sounds or something, don't realize the wrecking crew or anybody that there are people behind the scenes that might not get as much attention, but they're putting the music together. Well, people have no idea how much El Jardine did for that band. Oh, I mean he yeah. he doesn't get much credit at all, but he found the song Sloop John B., which was a top 10 hit for the Beach Boys, came to him from the Kingston Trio, and he was into folk music. And he arranged the song and said, hey, guys, why don't we do this? And it ended up being, uh, you know, one of three big singles off Pet Sounds. Um, so anyways, we, you know, we get into that. But I, Jerry can kind of elaborate on maybe uh, what we've done with some of the local people and how we're trying to embrace those people. Oh, <coughs> excuse me. Yeah, we, we've uh, actually done a lot. I'm one of the... Before we even get into the induction part of it, um, I think we counted well over 200 musicians that have played on on the Eastman stage with the Hall of Fame. And um, maybe 30 of them were people that weren't from Rochester. So we'll we'll hit people from, you know, from the rock and roll side of Rochester, classical musicians from Rochester, certainly a lot of jazz musicians. But then we've also inducted people who had a very, very strong ties here. Chuck Mangione, for one. Gat Man Joni for another, Batten uh, Don were, were two other ones. And these were people that actually made their career in Rochester before before going out and and really making a lot of noise in different uh, different genres of music. So the things that the people that we've honored in in this market has been pretty pretty incredible in the way that we've been able to bring a lot of people um, who are still out there being your local gigging musicians on that stage and um, just getting them exposed to a large audience has been phenomenal. We also inducted um, the Penny Arcade, a lot of a lot of radio people like uh, Jack Pelvino, Nick Nixon, uh, Uncle Roger. And when we did Uncle Roger, we had an all-star band come in, all people that played from the Penny Arcade. Some people from my band was were in that, which I was really 
really proud of because you know Roger had been such a great friend to all the local bands while he was alive, and and it was just a wonderful thing to be able to. Uh, to honor him in that way with people that I know he would have loved to have on stage. Roger was, I knew Roger, and he was just a sweet man. He He's a wonderful so guy. Much. And literally, we were talking, I think the last time I saw him was actually at a Ramones concert at U of R, and he was bragging about Van Halen's 5150 album of all things. He said he liked it. <laughs> last time I saw him was at Macy's. <laughs> <laughs> See, so, but as one thing, one of my only personal stories is my mom used to play bingo with Gene Cornish's mom, so I got Gene Cornish drilled into me about how good he was. Mm -hmm. I was good. The, 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 there was a story that uh, Paul Simon's people had, had called up and they wanted to know, and maybe Bruce or Jerry can, can help me out with this, who's going to be backing him at the, at the show and what's the band? And you know, they wanted to know the caliber of the band that was going to be uh, you know, and, and back of uh, Paul Simon and, and the songs and so on. I, I sent him a link to the website for Primetime Funk, and he he loved the band. And I said, look, uh, I think he said, I'm going to do two songs, 50 Ways to Leave Your Lover and uh, Late in the Evening, because those were the two songs that those two guys played on. Yeah. And, you know, that drum intro at the beginning of 50 Ways to Leave Your Lover, I mean, the story behind that is that, uh, you know, Gad was in the military Marine Band, and that was one of their exercises. So he got bored watching Paul Simon trying to figure out how to start the song, and he went in a room and started doing his drum exercises. Paul Simon was walking down the hallway to go to the men's room and heard this drum thing and said, what is that? And he goes, oh, I used to play that in the military band. So these are all great stories that come out. It's amazing. It does sound like it, though. You hear the bang, the... The drums. Wasn't it? Just, it was just Steve's birthday too, I think. Yeah, it was just bit. the other day. Yeah, and uh, and so, anyways, he calls up and uh, I gave him the link for Primetime Funk, and he said, "Wow, these guys are really good." Uh, and Juanita, his assistant, calls back and she says, uh, "Late in the K uh, late in the evening, key of F, and fifty ways to leave your lover, key of G, or you know, <laughs> whatever." <laughs> and it, that was it. He goes like, well, "I said, well, do you need to talk to the musical director?" No, 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 they'll be good. I'm not worried about it. Boom, boom, you know. And then they came and they not they killed it. They killed it that night. What's amazing too is just around here is the diversity of the music too, because you can go from this all the way from Sunhouse to the Plasmatics. Or a yeah, little, which yeah, we did. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's just amazing. Wendy, though. Wendy, we did. She, yeah. She lived, lived I, I don't think there are very many communities in the country that have the depth <coughs> of music that Rochester does. Yeah, there, no. There's some that have, you know, more. You know, certainly New York City, Los Angeles, Chicago, Nashville. You know, they've got a lot more. But the absolute depth of talent that we have for a city our size. I mean, we're we're so far beyond cities that are a lot. Bigger I would tell this story. A friend of mine moved to Atlanta. I think Atlanta, big metropolitan city. He would just say, "Rob, there's nothing. You could go around here. All the music. There's nothing down here. No well, local big, rap, big yeah. rap scene in in Atlanta, but the the music scene is not what it used yeah. to be. And um, that's is what you said about cities. You know, if it's a big city, you're going to have a lot more people. So yeah, you're going to have. More things, but yeah, like you say, for a smaller city like Rochester, I would think what, maybe second, third tier city, population wise, and, <laughs> to put out the amount of people. I think we're the forty eighth largest market in the country. That's, that's and, and to put out is the caliber, the not only the caliber, but the multitude of people that Rochester has is pretty impressive. Well, the Eastman has a lot to do with that. Oh, well, right, absolutely. I mean, you know, that's. Uh... I mean, there's some big Eastman alumni. Well, well, not, not, I'm going to jump in on this because not only are there some big Eastman alumni, alumni, which is true, I spend a lot of time with the Eastman on a weekly basis. Uh, I'll be there today. The shows, the recitals, all these pieces that the kids have to put on uh, as a matter of their scholastic studies uh, are phenomenal. And I'm here to tell you that the shows that I've seen and the kids that I've gotten to know um, are phenomenal. We will see in, in years to come, the, 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 the fodder is, is there for uh, more Hall of Famers in the Rochester market from stuff that's going on right now. Um, Jerry, uh, why don't you tell them about our Lauer Reward because that, I think that yeah, really Yeah, perfect helps. segue. Well, that, yeah, the Lauer Reward is, uh, it, it was uh, established a few years ago. And Gibson funded it for quite a while, and now we're uh, actually raising money to fund it. But... Uh, what that is, is every year we hold auditions for seniors in high school who are going on to study music in college. And um, we'll select two of them. They'll each get an award. 
a cash award and they also get to perform on the Eastman stage uh, doing whatever it is that they do. We've had so many just wonderful people. We had a cellist. Uh, we had a guy who did a whole lot of looping um, Sam with Nitch. a guitar, Sam Nitch. Yeah. Uh, just wonderful. To me, it's one of the highlights of the night is to be able to watch these these kids who are really phenomenal um, out there just playing their hearts out because it's probably one of the, the first times they get a chance to play on a stage with the caliber of the Eastman. This past Tuesday over at uh, the Little Cafe, I hosted with Paul Noons a, uh, a show that we do called Three Times 88 in that uh, we had, for the first time, nine performers. Of the nine performers, we had, uh, I believe, four, three or four from the uh, Rochester Music Hall of Fame, and I had three kids, I call them kids, uh, from the Eastman School of Music. Anybody we, compared to us are kids, kids, man. That's exactly right. Thanks, Rob. Wait a minute. Sound effect. <laughs> Bang! <laughs> <laughs> and we had uh, we had uh, two, two women, Naomi and Yvonne, and we had Aaron Kurz from the Eastman, who was classical, and they knocked it out of the park. The, the, the folks who were at the show that night and, and saw the caliber of music that they did and the spontaneity and the improvisation and magic was happening. And these kids are just on their game and they're loving the opportunity to come out and be out of the bubble of the, uh, the, the academic environment. They had a blast. And, and one of raised, the other things that's very cool. And we raised cool. money. We raised money for the Lowry Award. And one of the one of the things that's very cool right now is that there's another generation that's out there already being very very successful. Uh, people like Kate Lee O'Connor now. She was Kate Lee Gurnall. She graduated from uh, R.L. Thomas and Webster. She's already won her first Grammy. She's only 26 years old, and I think she won the Grammy two years ago. Uh, Jack Ryan, who has written hit records for uh, Pitbull and One Direction. Teddy Geiger's been writing a lot of uh, hit records for people out in Los Angeles. I mean, it's just a, what we've got for the next generation of people who can get in Law of Fame. I have that pride where one of the things I watch is Wood songs a lot of times. And I, Kate Lee was on it. And I just, mm -hmm. hey, it's Kate Lee. And it's just really cool seeing evolution and seeing how that talent and comes if, up. And if I may, do you think also a lot of it because of the success Rochester has is because of the nurturing nature of the city and the community to the musicians like you were describing the Lowry Award and giving these high school kids an opportunity to play on such a stage to really fuel the passion like you know so we kind of nurture musicians from the get-go. Well I'll tell you what I'll, I'll jump in first if I could on that because I I went to school for music. I was in all the music programs, uh, going through city schools back in the day, and we have never, ever, never let it um, fall to the wayside. The programs have always been there. The teachers have always been first rate. The instruction has always been great. We were taken to the Eastman Theater as little kids on the bus, and I think they still do this, and you know why? would see Howard Hansen conducting, you know, again, back in Howard Hansen, one of our... Uh, one, one of our lefties. Yeah, exactly right. And, um, and and it's from a very early age, and it's uh, going to continue, absolutely. Well, I think this is going to be a very good year and very good show. Because you want to go through some oh, of yeah. the... Oh, yeah. I think we may as well talk, talk about, about the who's, people. Who's, who's getting in there this year? Because uh, I looked it up, we have... Uh, uh, and I, I apologize in advance if I miss a name, mispronounce a name. Jack Alaco. Yeah, how want to talk about? Well, just talk about them individually. Yeah, eleven Emmy Awards, and apparently is the composer for The Young and the Restless and The Bold and the Beautiful, the soap operas you see on what CBS and NBC. And then I was trying to find the connection. He's a Nazareth graduate, and I believe a Nazareth trustee as well. And a Bishop Carney graduate. Bishop Carney. Oh, he went to Carney. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's see, there you go. Jeez, you're an alumni. He credits his yeah. uh, teacher at Bishop Carney, uh, Carney uh, uh, Ray uh, Shaheen. Shaheen, as being the, the big influence in his life, uh, musically, you know. And then we mentioned before Al Jardine is going in. Hey, Rob, you have a good little Al Jardine anecdote. Well, I found, actually, Brian Wilson did his Pet Sounds tour here. He played... Actually, at the same place you're having the ceremony, and it was an incredible show. But I happened to stay outside afterwards, and I met El Jardine. He signed ex my favorite Beach Boys album. It's not Pet Sounds, it's Sunflower, probably. Though I love Pet Sounds, he signed it, and he wrote afterwards, 
how he lived here, and he wrote his address down. Yeah. Yeah. Which we have a picture. We can actually put it up on the show if you yeah, want. Yeah, we can put it up, yeah. But Jerry can speak to that because you're... Yeah, because I grew up uh, two houses from him. You know, so he, he lived on Parkview Terrace, which is uh, in Somerville, right next to... At, right now, it's the Yacht Club Basin, the Rochester Yacht Club Basin. He grew up on the basin. At the time, it was the Rochester Yacht Club Swamp because they hadn't dug it out yet. But uh, my parents knew his family really well. They they were friends and... and uh, he, he left here pretty young, but he actually learned how to play uh, music here. I think his first instrument was ukulele, and, and he, he learned he it here. he was very proud of, during the show here, he made, he said very proudly that he lived here. Well, you know, when I was on the road, this was a very cool thing, because I, I was on the road for quite a while, and every time I would come home, my parents would let me know that, oh, the Beach Boys played here last week, and Al Jardine walked down the street, you know, and so I never got a chance to meet him because I wasn't, around when he was here i was i was always playing someplace else but i'm really looking forward to getting the chance to meet him this time oh. around so and his son's amazing too if you heard the, yeah his son his son sounds like early brian wilson he does i was i was yeah. actually saying okay it was the 60s there's a lot of free love did you really talk to brian because when they played don't worry baby <laughs> no he sounded like early brian wilson <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That was a good statement. I like that. I, hell, I couldn't help myself. <laughs> I find that <laughs> acceptable. Well, you know, the the thing is, is that, you know, some of the people who have been critical of what we do, saying that we don't pay enough attention to, you know, the people from Rochester, uh, somebody who shall remain nameless, uh, who was wrote about it in the local media, said, uh, Al Jardine lived here for five minutes. Well, that's, that's bull, because he actually lived here, I think, six years or something. Um, in the early fifties, I ever. I mean, yep, yeah. you have it written down on your CD. Yeah, you. and 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 he credits Rochester with the beginning of his musical uh, his interest in music. So, well, that is that's a really good thing to talk a little bit about because you know we do get some criticism, and the thing that the the people who do criticize us don't realize is that we're not necessarily a part of the local music scene because we really aren't. You know, we're we're part of the local music culture. That's a, a a big distinction because there are a lot of local music scenes here. There's the rock and roll scene. There's a classical scene. There's a jazz scene. There's the Latin scene. There's a hip hop scene. We have all of that. Here. I could actually speak to that where I was at the Ratch Mandanoff concert, which was a local. They had the local. I was in Nazareth Ensemble this week. Yep. More of a punk band the other nights. Yeah. And then more like literally every night there's something different. Yeah, a lot of diversity here, which is fantastic. And we've we've you know we've inducted the Rustics and Wilmer and the Dukes and you know those were local bands that that um, you know they did well you know I I know that uh, you know they had uh, at least Wilmer had one hit record um, the Rustics had something that was in the top two hundred top one hundred something like that they were also one of the first white bands signed to to Motown so you know they had some success outside of Rochester. But when they played in Rochester, they would get 4,000 people at a concert. When they would play, you know, in Pittsburgh, they might get 400 if they were, you know. But these were really solid local bands. And so, you know, we do look at everything on that level. And, um, you know, it, it it's a matter of taking the time to be able to, you know, get into the Hall it's of Fame. It really takes a while. hearing the stories, too, because I, I knew some people in New Math, and they tell me how well, they would do the old score GDs, but they'd also talk about when they opened the for the Ramones in Boston or in New York, these crowds and everything, and how cool it was. Oh, sure. Yeah. Well, and we try to we try to shake things up, too. Um, you know, the, I think it was the third year we, we had our ceremony. We inducted the House of Guitars, who, you know, really is an iconic music store, but also the birthplace of a lot of bands, a lot of bands met at the hog when they were buying instruments. It's like, oh, you play bass? Oh, you play guitar? Oh, you know, and that. And so we were trying to figure out, you know, we put this all-star band together to, to, to honor them, which did include Gene Cornish. Um, but, uh, you know, to open the show, we've always tried to come up with something that's really left of center. We try to throw people a curveball. Um, you know, my original vision for the show was to blend what they do with the... Um, Kennedy Center Awards and the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame kind of, you know, show a film and and kind of, uh, you know, uh, talk about the people and, and then have some kind of a musical thing. 
So, you know, the Oscars and the Grammys always have these opening musical segments that are really, you know, off the, you know, off the hook. So for that year, I said, well, you know, I'm trying to think what song has probably been played more times than any other song at the House of Guitars. I said, it had to be Smoke on the Water. I mean, it, it, it just, the I mean, song, every, every, every time I walk in that place, I hear somebody first. playing that riff, you know? Yeah. So I said, let's, let's shake it up. And we actually got some great local musicians. We got Jeff Costco and Donnie Mancuso, who had been in Black Sheep with Lou Graham and stuff, and kind of put an all-star local band together. And they opened the show playing Smoke on the Water, just like Deep Purple, very traditional version. And halfway through the song, the doors in the back of the theater opened up and down walked the marching band. And uh, we had a you know full blown uh, the Empire State marching, whatever they're called. So uh, my friend, my friend Rob Mount played for Lou Graham for quite a bit, and he's been playing locally for years. And he told the story about a musician, not from here, but some other place. He said that's how you got. They all went to music stores, and they would, oh, you need this, you need that. That was the connection. Yeah. So that was the House of Guitars for the Rochester one. It was the birthplace of many of the, oh, you're a bass player? Well, I'm looking for a bass player. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I, I we all take turns inducting different people, but I, I inducted the Hog because I worked there when I was a kid. And, you know, I, I was in high school in the 60s and 70s, and it was great to to be at that place. I mean, it was like the coolest job in the world. I was I was a complete music nerd. And my dad taking me down, there was one of the biggest treats going down to just explore there when I was a kid. Right. <laughs> and, you know, what I said was that, you know, when you know when I was in high school, you know, around 1970, you know, we, we didn't really have youth films. I mean, you saw a James Bond movie. That was like the coolest thing to see. Uh, you know, we didn't really have much television. There weren't youth-oriented shows. You might watch a music show like Shindig or Hullabaloo or maybe the see monkeys. The, or the Monkees <laughs> or see the rock band that was on Ed Sullivan that week. We didn't have video games. We didn't have cell phones. We didn't have any of that stuff. All we had was music, and music was the thing that united everybody back then. It's what it's what stopped the Vietnam War. It's it you know it, it, it was the. It, it, it spurred the sexual revolution. It was, it was always about music. And, you know, I said, you know, that was our church, uh, the House of Guitars. That's where we prayed, okay, because we would go in there to worship the music, and that's where you did it. So it was kind of cool, and I think people kind of got that when, when we talked about that. Um, Turntables and vinyl. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. But, yeah, and looking at the, the rest of the inductees, you're talking – a wide breadth of talent. Uh, Christine Laban, Laban, folk singer. Yes. Um, I actually, she's one I've never. Actually I've heard, heard of her, but I really couldn't explain much about her. Um, I don't. I didn't know a lot about her, but she she grew up, was born in New York, but moved to the Geneva area, went to uh, college in Brockport, uh, and has a lot of family in Rochester. And she just got involved in that music scene in the early '70s in Greenwich Village. Uh, uh, where the places that Dylan came out of and all that, and and uh, was on Rounder Records and had a pretty good career. She's actually done, I think it's twenty four yeah, studio I albums. I think I think on the website it said she just released her twenty third or twenty fourth. I heard right. about Rounder album. Records a lot right. now. My friend Michaela Davis is yeah, on there now. Big... All these other, it seems like it's really good. Right. I've actually, oh, I'm sorry. I've oh. actually seen Christine perform. She was over at. Um, Unitarian on Winton a couple of years back. Uh, my sister was in from Boston, and we all went to, to see her. I did not know of her at that time, and my sister introduced me to uh, to Christine, met her after the show. She's coming back to Rochester to come to the induction ceremony yeah. on the 28th from Boston to see her friend get inducted. So well, she I, I think maybe about in the 90s or early 2000s, she organized... A kind of a folk super group of folk women and I think it was kind of in response to what was going on um, with Sarah McLaughlin's tour there that she had the uh, Lilith Fair but uh, it was called the Four Bitchin Babes and it was her and Patty Larkin and a couple of other female folk singers and it's still going today they're not all the original people uh, she kind of has a revolving door thing but uh, she goes out and does that and mm -hmm. then she d does her own stuff and her songs have been cut by a lot of famous people and uh She's very talented, and she's very politically active, so I think uh, that'll shake things up a little bit. Um, 
Oh, you know, cage just, rattling. Yeah. Cage just cages will be rattled. Some, some of our conservative uh, oh, people may not enjoy what she has to say. You hear the collective gasp yeah, throughout the audience. We shall see. <laughs> <laughs> then we had uh, Jeffrey Springit. Springit? I'm terrible at names. Promoter at the Red Creek Inn for, what, almost 40 years. And I guess... It was before my time because he stopped doing that in 97. I came to Rochester in 2000. Yeah. Well, we had a lot of, like, so I don't, the I've heard about Arcade, the Red Creek. Yet. Penny Arcade, Pithod Clubs, one I used to hear lots of stories about scourges. But Red Creek, I heard, I was there, I heard so many different stories, so many different performers there. Good place to be. You probably played well, there, right? I, yeah, I have played there. I opened up for Livingston Taylor there, and then we did a few gigs there with, uh, you know, with my band Pearl. And, uh, yeah, it was it was a great place. Uh, one of the things I really love about Red Creek is that there's a Red Creek appreciation page on Facebook where people just say, "I saw this famous act at at uh, at the Red Creek," and it's just amazing how many people have played there. Harry Dean Stanton played there. He yeah. was really good, and I met him because he's very humble, but he was very good too. And the mix, the mix of of artists, is unbelievable. That was that went through Red Creek. Well, I'm doing the film now. You know, I, I create these films that we play before each induction. And I sat with Jeff for about two and a half hours last week. And he, his mother and wife, I guess, had done these unbelievable scrapbooks, starting with day one of, you know, everything that was done at Red Creek. And um, there you go. you got to shut your phone off. There you go. Case of beer for everybody. Yeah. <laughs> that's why we're kind of a randomness. That's, that's the rule. Case Tell of beer. Tell me to be on the show. They could be on the next one. That I was a Hall of Fame guy, too, on the phone. Oh, there you oh, go. Oh, he wanted to be oh, on, too. <laughs> How did he good. know that we were, you know, we're doing so, it? He wanted to call in. Uh, you know, so anyways, I'm doing this uh, meeting with Jeff, and they pull out this scrapbook. And a lot of people don't know. Okay, so he, he gets out of college in the summer of 69, and he's at Martha's Vineyard for the summer. And he said, I just decided to start promoting street dances. And, you know, his family had uh, owned Don and Bob's. And he had a restaurant background. Um, and he goes, uh, I, I did this unknown singer-songwriter by the name of James Taylor. And he pulls out this poster from 1969. Uh, you know, and then and he goes, and here's the one I did the following week. And it was the Velvet Underground with Lou Reed. And oh it was like, God. are you kidding me? And and uh, I, I had no idea the scope of his, his career. And then, of course, he starts pulling out the scrapbook. And I, I'll just rattle off a few of the people that played Red Creek. David Crosby. And this was after CSNY. This was on one of his solo tours. Greg Alvin, Muddy Waters, Professor Longhair. I mean, of course, all the Steve Gadd, Tony Levin stuff many, many times. Um, he had, uh, uh, you, you just name it. I mean, Jaco Pastorius. Jaco Pastorius. He, he had all kinds of people that were just huge names. I mean, James yeah. Brown. I saw James <laughs> Brown at Red Creek. It was like, for me to the microphone, I'm standing in front of him. It was amazing. Um, and it, it, what happened is he was a what they call a routing date. So a lot of times you would have James Brown would have a great gig on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and another great gig on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and like one or two shows during the week. And one of them would be Red Creek because it was like, well, I'd rather play for a lot less than what I normally get and, 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 and pay for the hotels and pay for everything. And Jeffrey was smart enough to pick up on that. Because if you look at when these people play, they were always, it was always a Wednesday night or a Thursday night. But it was this amazing talent. I mean, it was well, you like, too almost played there, but I guess what yeah. happened was they couldn't do the sound check because they were interrupting dinner. <laughs> so, yeah, he gave him a choice. He said, "You can either make noise, uh, and, and uh, I'm gonna, you know, he goes, you can make your noise, but you can't do it during my dinner hour, um, you know, for the sound check." And they said, "Well, if we can't do our sound check now, we're, we're leaving," and they left. But um, that was one of the few incidents where you know, it didn't quite work out. But uh, And the people that came there, Dylan came there and ate there when he did a show at RIT. Uh, um, I know uh, Frank Zappa came and ordered a steak, right? Yeah. And, For uh, anybody who doesn't know, it's where the McGregor's is now in Henrietta. Down thank you, God. Right. I was right wondering there's... where it was. Yeah, and, he, and Frank Zappa came in and ordered a steak, and Jeffrey says, we don't serve steak. So, you know, he had a very eclectic menu. But I have to give Jeffrey credit for two things. He really, 
kind of single-handedly launched the original music scene in Rochester. I mean, before there was a Scorgies or any of those places, people were playing original music at Red Creek. And he did that because he was across the street from RIT. Yeah. And the other thing he did that a lot of uh, a lot of people don't you know realize is that you know he he just uh, he would get all these national people to come in and they he would catch them on the way up of their career. And of course, Linda Ronstadt did an entire show there with uh, the the McGarrickle sisters. Mm-hmm. It was a PBS yeah, right. special. And international people as well. Robert Fripp, after he had done uh, oh, King League, Crimson, yeah. he was with the League of, uh, League of Gentlemen. Right. He sat there, I had a bowl of soup with him. I'm surprised Zappa yeah. didn't say, well, we don't serve steak. Well, I'm not steak. I'm Frank Zappa. Serve me. <laughs> because yeah. he was Zappa after That's all. true. He, he did have that. Well, he just, you know, he was playing, I think, you know, in somewhere, and he went there to eat. Uh, you know, he also, you got to remember, too, they had an eclectic menu, too. He also, I give Jeffrey credit. He br- he really brought reggae to Rochester. Yeah. I mean, there there wasn't really a big reggae scene at all until Jeffrey started doing that. And of course, he had the volleyball going on. He had all kinds of stuff. So it was, it was. He really deserves to talking be in there. about their eclectic menu. I just have to. <laughs> I, I was there once, and they were serving pumpkin soup, and so I said, I've never heard of this stuff. I got to try it. So they served me the pumpkin soup, and some lady. Walked by my table, said, "Oh, I wanted to try that," and actually started eating my soup. I mean, you just don't get that in too You're many still restaurants. Alive. Yeah. We're both still alive. Yeah. I know. I think yeah. it's a Scottsville thing because I've seen. Actually, right, like, <laughs> no, it is. I'm glad I, I live do, in though, Webster because I remember the Oatka. They had like a squash or pumpkin soup. I'm not saying that people come, but maybe they do come up and try your soup. But I mean, <laughs> a, you, you don't get that at say like a Spago or something yeah. like that when somebody. Just not often. No. Not often. Not often. Well, it got to be a meeting place too. I mean, they had a, a great bar. They had that spot up front. They had the backgammon tables. Folks would come in. Backgammon was really, really popular at that time in the 70s. And you'd sit and you'd hang and you'd listen to music. And it'd be a great well, spot I, to go. I saw a lot of unknown artists that ended up being superstars. I saw Brian Adams there. I saw Joe Walsh, uh, Joe, Joe Jackson uh, right when he came out with uh, Look Sharp. Uh, I mean, just just a spectacular number of people. You know, and he, and he had older bands like the Turtles. They were there. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, they even float. You know, yeah, it was good. And then the final two, I think, are actually kind of related. WCMF as an as an entity going in, and then the special award for Dave Kane, who I believe has been. And you're going to have some very CMF interesting people while. that are coming to play for CMF, aren't you? Yeah. Right. Well, you can talk about that. You know. You talk about that. Well, <laughs> yeah, you put that one together. Well, <laughs> it, 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 I we tried. They said, "Look, could you get somebody that fits our format of what is now basically classic rock?" And I said, yeah, I mean, I kind of live in that world, so I, I'm sure I can get to And I called everybody. I called Edgar Winter. I called Buck Dharma at Blue Oyster Cult. I called the singer for Kansas. I called a ton of people, uh, the, the guy who sings for Boston. They all said, I'll do it, I'll do it, I'll do it, but I can't do it that weekend. I'm booked. So uh, I decided to do kind of what we did for the House of Guitars. We put an all-star thing together, and I got Carmine, a piece who's in Vanilla Fudge and played with Rod Stewart and Jeff Beck and... Uh, Ozzy, um, we got Tony Franklin on bass, who's played with Pink Floyd, White Snake, um, and uh, he was in a group called The Firm with Jimmy Page and Paul Rogers. Um, I um, I was able to get Bumblefoot, uh, who was in Guns N' Roses for eight years. His name is Ron Fowl. He's phenomenal, um, and he's going to be the new guitarist in Asia, which is a band I uh, co-manage. And then uh, a local guy who has been living in Toronto for 30 years, Phil Naro on vocals. And our own Andy Calabrese from Primetime Funk will play the keyboards. So they're going to do kind of a medley. Of, I don't think I've heard him, but he's probably pretty good. He's pretty yeah. good, yeah. I think so, that guy he might be pretty good. He's we're going to do uh, oh, nice they're, they're yeah. going to do some Guns N' Roses. They're going to do Here I Go Again from White State. Carmen Apice, I've just been reading his book, and if you haven't read it, it's a hoot. Tell him that if you see him there, because it's really just... Slept stories with, slept with 4,500 women. <laughs> oh, my According goodness, but he's had the rock and roll life, I'll tell you. Good Lord. And the thing I have to say from all you young folks out there listening, that you have to remember, these days you can get music everywhere, but back in the day when you were my age, like 90 or so, like in the 1970s, you had to go look for it, and CMF was really different. I remember Spark Kicks, when you did. Yeah. but you would turn that on. They would play whole albums. They would just freeform it, and you couldn't and get it. They used it. to have live concerts on CMF yeah. all oh, the time, yeah. too. Yeah, they did. 
They and they were Your phenomenal. King Biscuit Flower Hour. I remember that. One. Well, totally. no, they they these were local original yeah. acts that they would put on the air. Late Avenue would, Studio. Uh, yeah, right at their studio, and uh, um, I got to do three of them. And what blows me away is I listen to them now, and the quality, the recording quality, was really outstanding. I mean, to this day, they still sound really good. The things that you could do back. Back then, you know, Rob, you had mentioned that you had to go out and search it. I recall in my CMF story, uh, years ago, Emerson, Lake, and Palmer coming on the scene. They were just putting out uh, pictures at an exhibition. A friend of mine had secured the first copy that hit Rochester. It hadn't even hit the, the, the stores yet. It hadn't hit the studios. You mentioned Spark Kicks. You could call the guys up on the phone, talk, hey, yeah, come on down. Now, I lived around the corner from Layton Street. One o'clock in the morning, we get in a car, we go down to the studio, we got, we got. <laughs> oh, he, oh, he used to, yeah, I know that, I know we, that. <laughs> your brother, Mark, Mark yeah, and yeah. I did a concert at CMF, uh, we were playing mini mugs and whatnot, so yeah, we, sp we, we, we spun uh, pictures in an exhibition for the first time in Rochester with spar kicks in the middle of the night at WCMF Studios. And I won my only street. time I ever won concert tickets was to the New Riders of the Purple Sage and the Outlaws in Buffalo from, they said be number five or something caller, and I just called them up in one, so <laughs> I had my mom go up to the studio and pick them up. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, if I can just jump in here with two stories on that. First of all, on CMF, they were the first, uh, they started in 1969, so 50th anniversary, they were actually started by a bunch of engineers from General Dynamics. They, those were the guys that originally uh, got the thing up and going. Uh, but what was interesting, they're one of five radio stations in the United States that has never changed its name or never changed its musical format. They've played basically rock and roll, uh, album-oriented rock and roll since 1969. And there's only five stations in the United States that have kept that uh, the same format and the same call letters. So I think that, the, you well know, that's deserved, quite an achievement. Yeah. But uh, just, I got to jump in on your Emerson, Lincoln, Palmer story because I've, I've been involved in the management of the band since the 90s. Uh, the funny story about uh, pictures in an exhibition is, of course, it was the first time a rock band recorded a complete classical, classical piece, piece of yeah. work. And, of course, Carl and, and Keith both went to the Royal Academy in London and they were classically trained guys. Keith and, and Carl both had a lot of jazz. Greg was in King Crimson. They had a lot of classical influence, and they had the Mellotron and all that stuff. So they do this thing, and they walk into Ahmet Erdogan's office in Atlantic and said, this is it. We've done this whole thing, and we recorded it live in Newcastle, and this is it. The entire picture is an exhibition done in a rock format, and it's going to open up the world of classical music to young kids. And Ahmet Erdogan said, I can't, do, I can't sell this record. I can't do anything with this. I'm sorry, guys. I'm just, you know, you're Sweet still under animals. contract. Go back and make me a, a, a typical Emerson, Lake, and Palmer album. So not knowing what to do, they went back to England, and, you know, they, they did what he asked. They they made an album called Trilogy. But while they did that, they had this record that they couldn't get released in the United States. In England, it got picked up by Island Records. It sold 50,000 copies as an import in the United States. Okay, and the minute that happened, they get a call from Ahmed Ergen who says, uh, you know that classical thing you had? <laughs> uh, I think we're going to put that out. Well, lo and behold, Plus, uh, it ended up selling 4 million copies wow. in the United States. That piece States. saved a lot of people's ears, too, because I tried to play piano, and I tried that piece, and I bombed it, so I quit, so everybody was saved from my horror <laughs> playing. <laughs> but the, but the, tell, let's plug time, the event. Tell us yes. about this, everything. Yeah. I wrote it down. Where do you get tickets? Where do you do well, all the fun stuff? The website is rochestermusic.org. Correct. That's correct. And so check that out. The details are what, Sunday, April the 28th, 7 o'clock at Kodak Hall at the Eastman Theater. Well done. It is the class of 2019 entering the Rochester Music Hall of Fame. Sounds like it's going to be one hell of a show. Yeah. Uh, I can tell you right now there's going to be about 25 songs in the show. So Ooh. if you want to go and hear a lot of music, that's where you should go. And I'm telling you, again, support your local music. And you never know. You see a band out there, I can just mention a few, Maybird, Michaela Davis, these young talents around here. And one day you will see them up on that stage. I, I and you'll know. say, hey, I saw them. 
I don't know anything about Michaela. Everybody's been talking about her. I gotta go check her. Well, out. She's a really good friend of mine, so I have to keep plugging. Well, what, what kind oh, of? Oh, she's a talent. Is, is she's she doing talent. original? Uh, I'll jump in on that. She's doing all original stuff and uh, and the new style that, that that they're doing. She's a harpist. She's classically trained. I believe she went to Fredonia. Uh, Crane School. Crane School. Crane, yeah. Potsdam, yeah. Yeah, that's for Jack. And a very good harpist. And she is. Um, a phenomenal singer. Her album of uh, delivery, Deliverance? delivering the thing yeah. about her music. If you go from her first album <clears throat> now, and she's only just turned twenty-seven, April 9th, That the, the the evolution of the way her playing is. It's amazing everything she brings in. It's one of those things where you can't wait to see what she does next. Happy belated birthday, Michaela. Yeah, she's bringing in some really, really good local folks. Alex Cote is playing yeah. with her, and um, you, you I mean, would you know. would you call it? popular music it's I mean, kind of hard it's harp it's sort of a mix of it's rock pop. every I mean, you got a band oh, yeah, yeah yeah southern star and they're very yeah. good keen mccarthy shane mccarthy alex mccarthy cote yeah, right. and a lot of them are, are local but i would just say <clears throat> give her a listen and tell because i'm really not good at describing anything like that yeah i, I gotta check her out because I've, I've heard her name now a million times and well, well, I have to do a little a pretty selective uh, record company. I have to yeah. do a little payola for this because I've known her for, we've been friends for six years and I have to promote my friends on this show. <laughs> but they're all good, I promise hey, you. They're all good. That's the thing. Find her on YouTube and it is very good. So, for, once again, rochestermusic.org, April the 28th, 7 o'clock at Kodak Hall. And thanks, guys. Thank you. And, and we yeah, were playing. Oh, yeah. We're Andy Calabrese guy yeah, in Primetime Funk. We're going to the, a track from the. What is it? The Rochester Music Hall of Fame house band, house band. Primetime Prime Funk. Funk. Yeah. The song is Been There, Done That off the album Here and Now. Here as in, you're going to hear this song right now. On that horrible pun, I think we should end. Guys, it was a pleasure. Yes, thank, thank you. you very Hopefully much. the show goes really well. It will. Yeah, make everybody sure you come. Keep, everybody keep tabs on who else. Let's is, just hope it's Rochester's be. not like a blizzard. Exactly. So <laughs> for all of us here at the Carnival and the Rochester Music Hall of Fame, thank you. And... Smile.